One of the other great things about this 11th conference, um, the Australasian conference, is that we have seven guest speakers from overseas. And it is my privilege to introduce the first of these, Professor Pradeep Singh. Pradeep graduated from Columbia University in New York and then earned his MD at Northwestern University Medical School in Chicago. Pradeep received postgraduate training in internal medicine and pulmonary and critical care medicine at the University of Iowa. He is currently a professor in the departments of microbiology and medicine and a director of the CF Research Development Program at the University of Washington. His clinical interests are in the care of adults with cystic fibrosis. Um, and his research interests um, cover the area of lung infections caused by Pseudomonas and other bacteria. Um, as Peter said before, Pradeep's here to talk about bugs, so we should learn a lot today. He has received the Leroy Matthews Physician Scientist Award from Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and the Parker B. Francis Award in Pulmonary Medicine. The Clinical Scientists um, in Transitional Research Awards from the Borough Welcome Fund and he's a Fellow of the American Association for, of Physicians and Ac American Academy of Microbiology. He has a great list and a fabulous CV. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce Pradeep Singh. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real, uh, real pleasure to, to be here and, and speak today about infection and CF. And I'm amazed by this audience uh, of uh, patients and families and people who care about CF, and it's great to talk to you. So I'm going to talk about <clears throat> airway infection and CF, and I'm going to structure my talk uh, with a series of experiments um, that I think will be instructive about where we are in thinking about infection and what the key challenges are as we go ahead. And I'm also going to point out that all of these challenges uh, come with opportunities to make um, real progress if, uh, if we keep focusing on the research and infection. And so I'll try to point those out. And so this is my view of how infection develops in CF, very simplified diagram. But what, I, what we, we all know <clears throat> that, it, or the current thinking anyway, is, is that in the newborn state, um, um, when the patient comes out of the womb, the lungs are sterile and probably histologically normal. But they manifest some kind of host defense defect. And as you probably know from following uh, the news in CF, this remains controversial. There's still multiple different hypotheses about really what can constitutes this host defense defect. Why are the patients uh, susceptible to infection? We still have a lot to learn about that. But there is a defect in uh, eradicating uh, uh, bacteria that get deposited in the lung. And so that makes patients susceptible to infection. And then one day, something changes in, in the lives of most patients where they become permanently colonized with uh, cystic, fibrosis, cystic fibrosis pathogens. And that colonization um, often is with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and then the patient reaches a chronic infection state. And I think we have a lot to learn, uh, and we can learn a lot by following along the bacteria and seeing what they do. And this is what I think I do. I think on this guy. I'm the professor of barbarian studies following along with the barbarians and trying to understand what they do inside the lung and why they're so uh, damn nasty. And so I want to point out one uh, uh, experiment which I think is, is very instructive in, in thinking about how we move forward. And so this is an experiment actually done by uh, investigators at the University of Washington, Arnie Smith and, and others, and they asked a very simple question. Is there any relationship between the susceptibility, antibiotic susceptibility of the bacteria harbored by a patient with cystic fibrosis and their response to treatment, okay? So what's plotted on the y-axis here is the amount of change in lung function that the patient gets after a course of treatment of tobramycin. What's plotted on the x-axis here is the amount of tobramycin that kills or stops bacterial growth. Okay? And so what you would expect and hope to see is some kind of relationship that looks like this. That if I had, if my patient had a very sensitive organism, was killed by a small amount of tobramycin, I'd see a big response, improvement in lung function. And if the patient was colonized or infected with a, 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 a very resistant bug, 
uh, that took a lot of tobramycin to kill, I would see a little bit of response. That's what one would expect. But this is what we actually see. This is the actual data from the study. There appears to be no clear relationship. It's a scattergram, okay? No clear relationship between how our patient does after a course of antibiotics and the susceptibility of the bugs that they harbor to antibiotics. So that raises some very key questions. And so the, 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 the overall question that I want to kind of shed some, uh, give you my thoughts about are why are these infections so difficult to treat and what causes this disconnect between what the laboratory tells us about susceptibility and the patient's response? And so I'm going to talk about, uh, this is my little cartoon about the CF airway and these are the bacteria in the blue here and I'll talk about these green uh, uh, shades around them, the uh, bacterial aggregates or biofilms. But I'm going to talk about two answers which I think address this question of why they're so difficult to treat. And one of them involves evolution, the, the genetic evolution of the bacteria during infection. And the second thing I'm going to talk about are, are changes in bacterial functioning and, and behavior that are caused by aggregated growth, by growth, growth inside these little balls. Okay, and I'll talk about the first one, uh, first one first. And so in each case, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to point out what the challenges are that we have to cure these infections, and also what, what, what opportunities are provided uh, for new uh, research and new potential strategies. And so let's talk about the evolution case first. So this is another cartoon. Here's what happens in chronic CF infections of Pseudomonas. So here's my Pseudomonas green bug. It gets inside the CF lung. And what we know from multiple studies including some of those done here in Australia, is that once the once this, uh, lung becomes colonized with a certain strain of Pseudomonas, that same strain, or I should say the descendants of that strain, the progeny bacteria of this bug are what stay in the patient's lungs for the rest of their life in most instances. Okay? It's not that they're coughing out bacteria, new strains are coming in, coughing out new strains are coming in. No, it's a case where this, but this guy stays there. Its lineage stays there, and it stays for decades. And so what that must mean should happen is that the bugs ha should be evolving inside the host. They're reproducing rapidly. They're under a lot of pressure. They're under a strange environment, under, under an environmental stress. So they must be evolving inside the cystic fibrosis lung, and they are. Now, if we think about how they may be evolving, inside the lung, there's two general patterns that are possible. And this is an oversimplification, but I think it's, it's, it's important to think about. So one possible pattern of how the bugs evolve in the lung would result in the, uh, the, the patient becoming infected with a dominant strain that's highly adapted to that lung environment. Okay, So this bug is evolving inside the host, and there's a dominant strain that's very, very adapted. So let me show you what this might look like. So here's our initial strain that caused the, uh, uh, the, the onset of permanent or chronic infection. It starts replicating, making daughter cells, okay? And then sometimes during the course of making these daughter cells, genetic mutations arise. That's in indicated by this asterisk. And, and now we have some mutant bacteria. They're related to this parent, but they're different because if mutations have evolved. Now, one possibility is, is that the conditions inside the lung favor one or a small number of these mutants. So in this example, for, for example, you have two daughter cells. They're slightly different because mutations have occurred in the bacteria, but this one's more fit. Okay, it's better adapted for the lung environment. It goes on to replicate. The same thing happens. This one's more fit. Same thing happens. This one's more fit. Okay, and at the end of the day, what one would have under this scenario is a highly adapted strain, different from the parent, related, okay, but different from the parent that inhabits the lung. And this, you could imagine, could be very difficult to eradicate because it's evolved to live inside the lung. So that's one scenario. Now, the other scenario starts out the same way. You have an initial strain, starts off the same way. You get genetic mutations in the bug while they're replicating inside the lung, okay? But what's different here is that instead of one of the isolates being more fit or predominantly fit, conditions in the lung favor 
the propagation of both of these. Okay, so now they both go on and replicate. More mutations arise in the siblings, or sorry, the daughter cells of these bugs, and now you have four of these different types that differ by different genetic mutations in the bacteria. They go on, they go on, the same thing happens. And under this scenario, what evolution produces is rather than a dominant adapted strain that outcompetes everybody else in the lung, it produces a zoo, okay? A, a highly diverse population of sibling bugs, again, all related to this initial strain. They're siblings, but they're all different from each other. And so this is a fundamental question, which scenario operates in CF? And so we were interested in exploring that. I'm going to show you some very simple experiments um, that helped us understand that. So here's the experiment. Go to the, uh, go to the lab, take some cystic fibrosis sputum, uh, culture out the pseudomonas in a way where you get rid of other bugs that might be in the mouth or colonizing the lung and just focusing on the pseudomonas for a second because we're asking a question about the pseudomonas evolution. Collect instead of what the clinical lab does when a patient gives a sputum sample, we'll pick one of these colonies or two or five at the most and say, geez, this represents your infection. Okay, instead of doing that, we picked thousands, 5,000. 2,000 in different, in different experiments. And then we pick those different bacteria, and I won't show you this data, but they're all, we confirmed that they're all siblings, just like I showed you in that diagram. They're all related, the progeny of that parent strain. And then we subjected them to a bunch of tests to ask how diverse has the population become during the course of infection. So let me show you that uh, these data. So now what you're looking at this is a bacterial plate, okay, Ag auger plate, about this size. We've just arrayed a thousand, sorry, arrayed a hundred of the colonies that grew out of a single sputum sample. And what's interesting about this plate is that it has bacteriologic media, it's designed for bacterial growth. However, it doesn't have any amino acids, okay? So that's a, a key nutrient that Pseudomonas usually can make itself, okay, out of basic building blocks. but uh, but, but, if, but if it can't make it itself, they can't grow. And so what do we see on this plate? We see some of the bugs grow very well, okay? They form colonies, that's a bacterial colony, but its neighbor doesn't grow very well. There's a large diversity in the capacity to grow without amino acids. Not important, to forget about the amino acids for a second. I'm just binning them. I'm just showing you that they're diverse, okay? Um, it, and this is one of those traits that they're diverse in. Let me show you another test. This is looking at the bacteria's capacity to swim. They have a, a motor, propeller, flagella that, that lets them swim around. That helps them get nutrients and invade, okay? Now what you're looking at is a plate, and in each well there's some media. And what we did was we took, in a high throughput manner, we took a bunch of pins, picked up a bunch of bacteria, we put them in the media, if they could swim, then the well becomes cloudy because we deposited them in the center and if they have the capacity to swim in the semi-solid medium, the, the well becomes cloudy. If they don't have the capacity to swim, they stay in a ball where we put them, okay? So yes can swim, no can swim. And what do you see? Inside this single sputum sample, all sibling related bugs derived from the same parent, you have a high diversity in the capacity to swim. Some can swim, some can't swim. Let's look at another trait, growth on ciprofloxacin. This is, high, uh, this is one microgram per milliliter of ciprofloxacin. Same thing. This should be an array of 100 colonies. Some grow extremely well. Some don't grow at all, but there's high diversity. Let's look at another trait, high concentration of tobramycin, 50 micrograms per mil. Hard to achieve that uh, unless you inhale it. Very, uh, couldn't get this high by giving IV tobramycin. Again, you see this large diversity. Several colonies grow very well. Some grow in a, in, a, in, a, in a meager manner. Some don't grow at all. High diversity in that trait, okay? Here's another antibiotic, uh, ceftazidine. Same situation, high diversity. So what this data, I won't go into uh, uh, a lot of the analysis that we did on this, but what the data says is, is that when we, uh, oh sorry, let me say one other point. Every time we add another test, we see 
diversity. So if we, if we subject them to different antibiotics, different stresses, oxidants, host defenses, we see variations. So what's happened inside the patient is, is that infecting strain has become a zoo of clonally related variants that all differ in function somewhat, but are all related to the same parent strain. And what we've done here, this is a graph, which I won't go into how we generate it, but, but what's important about it is, is that we've binned the bugs now using those tests, okay? We've binned them into different subpopulations. So we say, okay, one subpopulation are the guys that can swim, they're resistant to this, they're sensitive to that, they can grow without this, they can grow without that. It's an identity, a binning, okay? And this population is different. This population is different. And this is what we see every time we do these experiments from bacteria in the cystic fibrosis, uh, uh, pseudomonas in the cystic fibrosis lung. There are one or two or three dominant populations, and then there's a long tail. Okay, y-axis is the percent of the total in that sputum sample. This goes further out. I just showed you 24. It goes further out. There are some, a lot of variants that are present at 0.1% of the population, okay? And those are very important, I think, and I'll show you why I think that. So why does this matter? So now to try to understand why this might be important, we, 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 it's, it's useful to turn to thinking about ecology. And there's an ecologic concept that's called the insurance hypothesis, okay? And that idea is basically that diversity provides insurance for populations, a, sort of a form of biological insurance that protects it against changing environmental conditions, okay? And so the idea here is, is that these different subpopulations of pseudomonas that have evolved inside the lung, they have different traits, and that extends the range of conditions at which the population can thrive. One guy doesn't do well, there's somebody there to take his place. That's the idea of biological insurance or the insurance hypothesis. And in that, if, if this happens, then these rare guys, you might not ever detect them unless you did the crazy thing that, that Ben Stottinger did in the lab of picking thousands of colonies from a single sample. These guys could be very important. And here's the basic idea. Now, I'm taking those subpopulations and graphing it a little bit differently. On the y-axis is number of bugs. Okay, and each, each bar here represents a different one of these subpopulations, and I've simplified it. Different clonally related sibling subpopulations. This is what it might look like. And the idea is, is that when treatment comes around, antibiotics or some other kind of treatment, the treatment might actually be quite effective. Look, this blue guy, he went way down. Some of these other guys went way down. But as long as there's one variant or one subpopulation that doesn't get killed or treated by that stress or treatment, it, 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 it increases in numbers and compensates for the loss of its sibling bacteria, providing insurance, okay? And so the idea that we're interested in exploring is that could it be that these resistant subpopulations are a big part of, of treatment resistance? and that they actually sustain infection when stress is applied to the bacteria. Okay, That's, this is a cartoon. Now let me show you some actual data. Okay, here's one patient. Shows you this graph of different subpopulations. Sorry, they're not numbered here. The, the, the numbers don't matter. Different subpopulations and their relative abundance. This is when the patient was well. Now we apply antibiotics. What do we see? We see insurance, okay? The dominant subpopulation was markedly reduced in numbers. But this number five here, whatever it is, was low. It popped up. It became 60%. This number 23 was barely detectable before treatment. It popped up. So we have co compensatory shifts in the population composition that go on to sustain infection over time. And that's a consequence of the evolution of diversity in vivo couldn't happen unless the bacteria evolved diversity in vivo. Now, this is a challenge, okay? In an established infection, I would uh, guess or hypothesize that there's going to be some variant, some subpopulation that can do almost anything, resist most stresses, and that's a big challenge. 
because that means that these shifts in, in population composition could blunt the effect of many treatments. But it's also an opportunity, okay? Because now what I can do is I can go to my patient, I can put them on treatment, I can see which, who pops up, okay, which whack-a-mole comes up, and I can study this guy, and then I can understand what is he doing, <laughs> okay, to personify it, that allows him to resist the stress in vivo. So I can do comparative analysis of population five, which went up during treatment, population one, which went down during treatment, and I can now understand by comparing those bacteria what functions, what mutations, what's different about them that allows this number five to resist killing. And so let me show you that, just as, as uh, 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 some, some example data. So this is the same graph. Sorry, I'm just now showing you one and five, getting rid of the long tail. Before treatment, one was dominant. After treatment, five was dominant. And now what we can do is we can grow them in the laboratory, study their patterns of gene and protein expression, and say what's different about them, okay? And this is very interesting. So here's population one. It has a very low expression of a pump, which pumps out antibiotics out of the cell. Five has a very high expression of that pump. That tells us something about what's important in treatment resistance. That's a known gene, this drug pump. We've also found, in most instances, that most of the genes that change, so here's two other hypotheticals. We don't even know what they do. They're genes, but we don't know what their function are, is in the bacteria. And we see marked changes in these genes of unknown function. Here's one gene. This one's up 90-fold in population five. That, 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 that was the mole that, 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 that came up after I whacked it with the antibiotic. Now, I need to understand what these genes do to, to, to make a difference, I think, in treatment resistance. And that's uh, some of the, the, the research that's going on. So to summarize what I've told you so far, the Pseudomonas isolates that establish chronic infections in CF, they evolve into many different subpopulations. The subpopulations differ in stress resistance, and they can compensate for each other as conditions change. They produce biological insurance. And these shifting population compositions make the infecting bacteria very hard to eradicate. So the opportunity is we can focus on these subpopulations that increase to understand the bacterial functions that are needed to resist treatment in a human being by collecting these bacteria. So the second thing I want to tell you about now, that was the evolution uh, small story. Let's talk about these bacterial aggregates. Um, the common name uh, is, 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 is used, bio, biofilms are used to describe this aggregated growth. I'm moving a little bit away from that because I don't, it's, it's a, uh, in the field, the, the, what, what, what a biofilm really is and the definition is getting quite cloudy and so I don't really, fully understand uh, what it is. People use it differently. And when someone says biofilm, they mean something very different from another person. So I call them aggregates or aggregated growth. And this is what we see in CF. We don't see the bugs living as free living individual organisms. We see them in these little balls or groups or clusters or aggregates. And let me show you a picture of that. Well, that's a cartoon of that, okay? Um, but let me show you why that's important. Oh, sorry, before I do that. So this is the basic concept. This is how we've been studying bacteria in the lab um, uh, for most of the history of microbiology. We put them in a rich bacterial growth medium, we shake them up, we give them a lot of nutrients, give them a lot of oxygen, they're each free living free agents, they're free living bacteria. In many chronic infections, they're living like this, in these balls or aggregates. So let me show you some pictures of this. This is an electron micrograph of cystic fibrosis sputum, okay? So here's the debris and mucus and junk and dead cells and all the other stuff that's in sputum. These are the bacteria, this sausage one. They're, they're, they're rod-shaped, okay? Here's one. Sometimes you cut them on long ways and they look like a rod. Sometimes you cut them on end and they look like a circle. Depends, it depends on their orientation. But there, whenever we look in CF sputum, we see them living clustered together, encased in this dense matrix glue that surrounds them. They're living in balls. That's important. It's not just CF. 
We see the same thing in many, many different kinds of chronic infections, and I would say maybe most chronic infections. So here's a completely unrelated kind of chronic infection. It's unrelated except for the fact that it has the same characteristics as CF. You can't eradicate it with antibiotics, even when the bugs are sensitive. It's a heart valve infection. Here's the heart valve. You can imagine this thing floating around in the blood and opening and closing uh, um, um, to help to make the heart function properly. If you zoom in on the area of infection, what do you see? You see aggregated bacteria clustered together in a ball. Okay, same thing. Here's a picture from a colleague at, at UPenn of an electron micrograph of bacteria in chronic sinusitis. Okay, here's the sinus mucosa. What do you see? These are the bugs. They're encased in the slime. They're, they're living glued together. They're not as free-living individuals. Here's a chronic wound infection micrograph. Okay? Same characteristic. Can't eradicate it no matter how many antibiotics you throw at it. Okay? This is, these are all the neutrophils, these black things here. These are the bugs. These little dots are the bugs. A ball of bug, a ball of bug, a ball of bug. Here's a, here's a close-up. They're living aggregated together, surrounded by a bunch of host defenses. These are neutrophils. These are killer cells that should be able to kill these bacteria, but they can't inside this ball. Now, why is that important? It seems very simple, a ball versus an individual uh, a, a bug, but it makes a huge difference. And so here's an experiment. So you take a, a pseudomonas, okay? Pick a colony of pseudomonas chlorine on a plate. This happens to be a lab strain. You can do the same thing with the cystic fibrosis isolate. So grow it up in the conventional way as a free living bacteria suspended in rich medium, rapidly growing. Hit it with tobramycin, okay? What do I see? So on the y-axis is the number of bacteria in a log scale. So it's about 10 to the seventh bacteria. One with seven zeros, a lot of bugs. That's what I start with. Use a small concentration of tobramycin. It's a great drug. Eradicates. It's a wonderful drug. Works great under these conditions. Take the same exact pseudomonas. Now I grow it as a ball. And now I try to kill it. Starting numbers are the same. 10 to the seventh approximately bacteria in this ball versus free living. 100-fold times, 100-fold increase in the concentration of tobramycin, incomplete killing. 1,000-fold concentration of tobramycin, still incomplete killing, okay? This is the fundamental problem, or I should say a fundamental problem. Now, I want to make one important point, and that is, is that this is a phenotype, not a genotype. So what I mean by that is, is that this is not fixed resistance caused by genetic mutation. This is a consequence. This resistance is a consequence of growth in this ball. If I take this bug, grow it like that, it becomes resistant. If I take this bug, grow it like that, it becomes sensitive. It's not a her heritable trait like the evolution stuff I was telling you about before. This is resistance caused by the growth conditions. It's reversible. It depends upon living in the ball. So why is that? What produces uh, this high tolerance? I'm going to use the word tolerance to differentiate it from resistance. Okay? Resistance, when I use that word, I mean the bug has become muta mutated and can't be killed no matter how you grow it. Tolerance is this phenotypic uh, resistance, so I can't kill it because of the growth state. So what produces that? And so the field has been grappling with this problem, and there's two main hypotheses about why we can't kill these balls. So the first one is about penetration. So I got a big ball, antibiotics can't get in there. I like this one because it's simple. I like simple. Uh, antibiotics can't get in there, can't be killed. Okay. The second idea is, is, is related to nutrient starvation and starvation responses. So the, ball, the bacteria in the balls or aggregates are starved for nutrients and that starvation is what produces their tolerance. So I'm going to show you a couple of experiments that try to distinguish between these possibilities. So let's take the first hypothesis. 
antibiotics can't get in there. So this is a beautiful experiment done by uh, a colleague at Montana State, Phil Stewart. Um, he's a, he's a, a, me a mechanical engineer working on bacterial infections. He thinks like an engineer, <laughs> and we need that. And so Phil designed this very simple apparatus um, to, 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 to test this idea about antibiotic penetration. So here's what he did. He took a slab of auger, okay? Put a filter paper on the top of it. He grew a bacterial aggregate on the filter paper so it could grow up and he could make an aggregate. He didn't care about sputum or lung or he just wanted a bunch of aggregated bugs. So he did that. Then he could pick up his filter paper with the aggregate on it, okay, nice and simple. He could now put it down on a new slab of agar that had antibiotics on it, in it, okay. And then the, the, the last piece of Phil's uh, high-tech apparatus was another piece of paper, okay. He can put a second filter disc on top of this bacterial aggregate, and now he can measure the penetration of antibiotics through this thing. Very simple, very beautiful, highly informative. This is what Phil found. So on the y, x axis plotted time in minutes after he moved it to the antibiotic containing agar. On the x axis, sorry, y axis is plotted the amount of antibiotic in the top disc divided by the amount in the agar. So if it got to one, that would be perfect penetration, right? Same concentration in the top as in the bottom. That would be one. This is what he saw. Penetration is actually quite good, okay? So it t there is a little bit of a time lag, and that might be important because the, these are living things, and maybe they can respond during these 100, 200 minutes. But at the end of the experiment, you get almost perfect penetration or diffusion of the antibiotic through the aggregate. It's not penetration. There are other, other uh, experiments using different models that say basically the same thing. So in summary, now, now that we know this, we say, of course, this should happen <laughs> because it makes sense. This matrix or glue is, is mainly water and, and different kinds of sugars, and of course things should penetrate through that very easily, and, and it does, even when they become very thick. So in, the conclusion is that in spite of rapid diffusion of antibiotics, when you put bacteria in these aggregates, they resist killing. So what is it then? So the second hypothesis to explain this, this, this tolerance is that the bacteria in aggregates are starved for nutrients, and it's that starvation that produces their highly res high, res high tolerance to antibiotic killing, okay? We see the same thing in many cancers. Cancer, anti-cancer drugs target the functions that cancer cells need to grow and replicate. If you're not growing and replicating, the drug doesn't work very well. That's true of antibiotics, too. They target growth functions. What does the bug need to replicate and reproduce and make more bugs? If you're not replicating and reproducing, the, 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 the drug works less well. So this is about slow growth and starvation. So let's go back to Phil. Ah, okay, need an engineer for this. So Phil designed an apparatus where he could take uh, uh, specific electrodes. This one happens to measure oxygen. He's done it with other things. And he's inserted these electrodes into the bacterial aggregates to ask the question, are the bugs in the center or near the center, or anyone that's not on the periphery is a better way to say it, are they starved for these key nutrients? This is what he found. On the y-axis is plotted the concentration of oxygen, 21%, that's room oxygen. This is the depth inside one of these clusters in microns. Sorry, it's not there. Very small uh, distances. And as soon as he gets into this thing, the concentration of oxygen plummets. Key, you can't, these bugs can't replicate unless they have oxygen. Now, why would that be? I just told you that antibiotics penetrate almost perfectly. Why, don't it, why doesn't oxygen penetrate? Why don't the other nutrients that the bugs need to grow, why don't they penetrate? Well, they do penetrate. And this is not a penetration problem. This is a consumption problem, okay? This is what we call in the lab the buffet line hypothesis. The guys in the front of the line eat first. 
and the guys in the back of the line eat what's left. And so you have these marked gradients in key nutrients in these clusters that's a consequence of the consumptive activity of the overlying cells. So he uses oxygen, he uses oxygen, and by the time you get down in the center, oxygen concentrations are very low, the bacteria aren't growing. Same thing is true for iron, probably the same thing is true for other nutrients that they need. So, as I just said, these gradients result from nutrient, uh, nutrient consumption, not failure to penetrate. And we've known for decades, actually since the advent of penicillin, that nutrient-limited cells are very, very hard to kill no matter what you throw at them because the drugs target growth functions. So, to summarize, the bacteria uh, uh, grow uh, aggregated together in CF, and that's true of other kind of chronic infections that are hard to eradicate. Nutrient consumption by the bacteria that are on the periphery causes starvation in the central regions. And these starved cells resist killing by most, most kinds of antibiotics. Now there's an opportunity here, that's a big challenge, okay? But there is an opportunity here. For example, we could try to reverse this starvation of the internal cells um, and sensitivity may be restored. So let me show you a couple of, this is not ready for prime time, not ready to go into a human being, but this is the kind of stuff we're thinking about uh, um, in order to, 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 to make a difference here. So let's go back to Phil. Here's an approach from Phil Stewart's lab. I don't like this one. This is where, the, this is where maybe you don't need the, this is where being an engineer might be a problem, okay? But he says, well, if it's nutrient limitation that's causing them to be so difficult, let's give them nutrients. I don't know that I want to do that in a human being, okay? But I want to know the result, okay? I want to know the result of the experiment. So he takes these bacterial clusters, he gives them extra nutrients, this is what he sees. Okay, so with no extra nutrients, he started with 10 to the 10th bugs in this experiment, didn't get much killing. He spikes in extra nutrients in a pulse. He can sensitize the bacteria, get a lot more killing uh, after nutrient repletion. It's interesting, it could be done in a different way and we're, we're working on uh, ways to trick the bacteria and to think they have nutrients and speed up their replication machinery so we can kill them. I don't know that I necessarily want to give them more nutrients. Let me show you another approach to this idea. Again, this is laboratory work, not ready for prime time, but it's, 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 it's what we're thinking about. So the other idea was, well, maybe we can disperse these clusters, maybe we can break them apart, and that will restore sensitivity to killing. And a key point here and this is not about CF, but it's just about bacterial evolution, is that bugs have ways of getting out themselves, okay? Because if you think about it, if I form a cluster or a ball and I can't get out, that's actually an evolutionary disadvantageous thing for me because if conditions deteriorate, I wanna be able to hit the road and move somewhere else. I've evolved motility. We think about how important moving around is. So the bugs that can form balls like this also have mechanisms to get out of the balls, and we call that dispersion. And this dispersion is an active process. The bacteria can sense that they want to disperse, and they can turn on machinery to break up the uh, matrix and get out, and I'm going to show you some movies of that. So if we were able to disperse the bacteria, could we make them more sensitive to killing? Here's an experiment. I won't go into the details, but what we did is we took Pseudomonas and we engineered their dispersal genes under inducible control. So basically what we did is took those genes out, we put a, a switch that we could turn on and off by adding a chemical so we can induce it, we can, do, we can force the, the, uh, the, the, the dispersion genes to be active. And then we grew uh, 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 up aggregates and then turned on the dispersal genes. And so the experiment was, what if we turn on the dispersal genes, can we get them to come apart, and do they become sensitive to killing, um, uh, measure the antibiotic susceptibility? So let me show you a couple of movies of this process. So this is a, a, a bacterial aggregate, okay? So this is the size of one cell. I don't know if you can see, that's one bacteria. This is millions of bacteria in an aggregate, 
Okay? Now I'm going to show you a movie where I start at the top of this aggregate and I take a series of Z uh, images and I move down. So you're going to look down through the cross section of this aggregate. Okay, going, starting at the top, going to the bottom, and what you see is that this thing is solid, okay? Full of bacteria, millions of cells, it's solid on the way down. Now if we turn on the dispersal, dispersal genes uh, by flowing in media that has the signal that controls those genes, this is what we see. So the dispersal pattern occurs in the center. And that makes actually good sense because that's where the conditions are the worst. So the bacteria turn on these genes when the conditions are under poor, con poor are, are poor, and we help that along by engineering them. And they've hollowed out, and now there are free swimming bacteria in the center of this cluster. Okay. So now I'm going to show you a movie where instead of going up and down, I'm just focusing on one plane in the center of uh, of this aggregate here. And so what you see is the bacteria have dispersed in the center. They're actually forming a tunnel, okay? And they swim out of this tunnel and then disperse and get out in the regular media. That's what it looks like in the lab. I have no idea if, it lo if, if something like that would be seen in sputum. I think it would be very different, but it's, 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 a, it's an interesting possibility. So what do we see now in terms of antibiotic susceptibility? So, this is, a, this is the data. On the y-axis is plotted the bacterial numbers. Here's tobramycin. I'm going up on tobramycin concentration. If they're in aggregates, I got to get super high, 1,000, 10,000 micrograms per mil to kill them. If I turn on the dispersal genes and, I suscept, I, 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 and, and they become free living individuals, they become a lot more sensitive. So. That's a potential possibility. It's something we got to think about. You can think of bad reasons, the reasons that might not be such a good idea as well. But we got to think, think about this broadly, I think. So I'm just going to end um, in thinking about chronic infection, about how the CFTR potentiators uh, affect uh, a chronic infection, and in, in, in particularly on Pseudomonas, because that's what we've been focusing on. And so uh, this is a study that we did in collaboration with Ed McCone at uh, uh, St. Vincent's Hospital in Dublin. We've been studying bacterial counts, pseudomonas counts with quantitative cultures after the onset of ivacaftor treatment. And so this is, uh, I think it's about 10 people or, or nine people. Um, on the y-axis is plotted the days after starting after ivacaftor. This is 48 hours after starting ivacaftor, seven days after starting ivacaftor. These are the individual patient data. This is a log scale, okay? And, this, and the red line is the mean change. So you see a very marked improvement in just a short time. I'm going to show you the longer term data, same, X, same Y axis, but now I'm going out to about eight, uh, 700 days. See a marked decline. I want to show you some details. I just wanted to show you those graphs, but I'll, I'll point out a couple of the details. So let's look at this first seven day period first. What we found in this very small study was extremely rapid declines in pseudomonas counts in the sputum, almost 200-fold reduction by day seven, okay? Really, really remarkable. The other thing I think that's very, very remarkable is that the pattern of decline, look at these individual lines. The pattern of decline in general was quite similar, even though the starting counts in the lung varied by four orders, five orders of magnitude. That's very interesting. That suggests to me that this is a clearance phenomenon because most antibiotics don't work very well when bacterial counts get high. So as you go up on starting counts, you get less of an effect. Clearance might be agnostic to starting counts because you're just sweeping them out. Let's look at the longer term trend and a couple of observations. And these were all chronically infected people, been infected for years. We didn't see eradication in any person of, of uh, nine that we studied. And that's kind of consistent, I think, with other reports. We had people who were unable to expectorate sputum, couldn't produce any sputum at, 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 at particular uh, 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 days. But when we checked them again later and, and really encouraged them to, to produce sputum, they remained chronically infected. So there was some pseudomonas still left in the lung. And we did genetic fingerprinting analysis. 
of the Pseudomonas late and the Pseudomonas early. So what was there at day zero and what was day at, there at day 700? And as I showed you in that evolution graph, they're siblings. So these weren't new infections. They didn't clear and get reinfected. They stayed persistently infected. Now, one of the things that's been quite interesting and one of the conundrums about Ivacaftor, five, thanks, I'm almost done, um, uh, is, is, is that it's been difficult to find predictors of success or, or, or response. So the, the most, uh, the, the, the obvious thing to look at, look at that makes a lot of sense is, is that we would be able to see a correlation between how much the lung function changes Okay, the change in FEV1, this is a big improvement in lung function, little improvement in lung function. We should see some kind of relationship between that and how well the sweat chloride gets corrected after ivacaftor treatment. But as you can see, and, and, and other studies have seen this as well, the Gold study saw this, and we saw it, there was no relationship. It looked like a scattergram, okay? Another scattergram, which is another, uh, every time we see a scattergram, we got a headache because we don't understand what's going on. No, no relationship between how well the chloride improves and how well the lung function improves. But when we looked at the pseudomonas counts, okay, on the y-axis, same y-axis, change in lung function, big change in lung function, poor change in lung function. Now if I look at the amount, the pseudomonas were reduced at day seven in this study. I saw a very tight correlation between if I got a big reduction in pseudomonas, I got a big improvement in lung function and vice versa. So that's important because that might tell us what's going on or what's going on in part, okay? And it's led to, the, this is an obvious hypothesis, but it's just this hypothesis that when we use these new drugs to correct CFTR function, maybe one of the things we're doing is reducing pseudomonas or other pathogens. We just focused on the pseudomonas because that's what we have expertise on and it's an easy thing to, easier thing to study because so much is known about the bug. And it's that reduction that results in the lung function improvement. Now that's an opportunity, okay? Because if this is doing this, and this is what's improving our patient, then, or in part improving our patient, we could try other independent interventions simultaneously to further lower the counts, further improve lung function. So I'm gonna end with one last, uh, uh, experiment, but it's a cartoon. I'm not going to show you the actual data. But I showed you this before. What happens after Ivacaftor treatment? So I've already showed you this data, that the initial strain diversifies into a zoo. Guys, like two slides. Into a zoo. Now, after Ivacaftor treatment, there's two possibilities. One possibility is that only certain variants get through and go on to maintain the infection. The other possibility is, is that everybody gets through. And we need to know whether it's possibility A or possibility B, because if Ivacaftor reduces the diversity, that's an opportunity to get rid of some of that insurance. And I won't show you the data, but our preliminary data su suggests it's a situation like this. But after treatment, it's not all these variants that gets through, it's a subset, it's a bottleneck. And that could be a big opportunity um, because we might not have uh, insurance from diversity. So to conclude then, showed you some challenges that come with opportunities. The evolution of diversity in the population makes it very hard to kill, but if we study these resistant subpopulations, they could tell us about the functions needed to resist treatment. Challenge, nutrient-limited cells within aggregates are tolerant to most antibiotics. But there's an opportunity. We can reverse or we can exploit this nutrient limitation to sensitize cells. And lastly, when we correct CFTR function, we may not elim eliminate established infection. But there's an opportunity because the, the, the post-correction infections may be less diverse, making them easier to kill. So I'm gonna, I, I just want to conclude by showing you some of the people who did, uh, provided some of this data. Ben Stottinger down to win, Katie Heiser and Peter Jorth are all, were all postdocs in the lab and did some of the work on the evolution and the Ivacaftor studies and, and some of the work on nutrient-limited cells and dispersion. Ed McCone uh, collaborated with us on the Ivacaftor study and Moira Aiken on several of these studies. And I showed you some work from Phil Stewart at Montana. So thank you very much uh, for your attention.